following is my conversation with Jennifer Jordan. Uh, Jennifer is my friend. She is a very experienced early stage investor with wealth of experience when it comes to early stage, uh, early stage investing. He's currently managing director at Techstars Barclays uh, Accelerator Program in New York, which is very FinTech focused. Uh, Jennifer has very deep understanding of technology, uh, its strengths, its weaknesses, its limitations. Uh, we, uh, in this conversation, talk about different entrepreneurship models, their relative pros and cons. We talk about Techstars, Y Combinator. Uh, we compare them. Uh, we also talk about venture, different venture studio models. Uh, we go into ethics of AI and dark side of AI. Uh, I'm sure you'll find that uh, very, very interesting and relevant. Uh, Jennifer is also working these days on uh, new business models emerging uh, from data trusts uh, and how to do uh, data trusts properly. Uh, so we talk a lot about we talk a lot about that. We talk about a convergence of ML and blockchains, uh, amongst other things. Uh, she has ton of advice for uh, entrepreneurs, uh, practical advice. Uh, she's also looking for people working on uh, data trust related startups to get hold of her uh, for advice, for you know investments, uh, all that fun stuff. Uh, here is no other than Jennifer Jordan. Uh, hope you enjoy, hope you enjoy this conversation. Jennifer, how are you? I'm good, Amjad. Thanks for having me here today. I'm super excited to talk with you. You too, and it's, it's gonna give us an opportunity to talk you know, after, after all these years. And uh, I'm so impressed with all the things uh, entrepreneurship wise uh, that you are that you are doing. You probably, Jennifer, are very knowledgeable about the MIT ecosystem and cluster because uh, mm -hmm. you have been very involved with them and, and now Techstars. Uh, so maybe we start with uh, uh, just your uh, recent experiences and journey. And uh, I'm very interested in uh, knowing about uh, Techstars. I will, I'll make a confession. I don't know as much about tech stars as I should, uh, but I do know a little bit about the Y Combinator program. So maybe you can also uh, draw sure. a contrast between you know how uh, tech star programs, and I know that tech star have different focuses, and uh, you know, uh, and it is somewhat differentiated from uh, Y Combinator. Uh, but yeah, sure. let's, uh, let's let's get let's get right into it. Okay, that's super exciting. So um, I guess the first thing you should know about me or people should know about me is that I'm an early stage investor. Um, I started my career in investment banking. I've also run investor relations for publicly traded companies. And then I spent six years uh, and a half years investing on behalf of the state of Massachusetts after I went to MIT. So it's, first of all, it's just amazing still to be on this podcast with you since we were classmates at that program in Sloan nearly what 10 years ago now um, when we first met and so most of my time when I'm investing I focus on things around data and um, data driven businesses and that leads me naturally into AI but I also really have a passion for that early stage when I was a banker 25 years ago um, you know companies could go public for 30 million dollars and we were a really tiny bank. So that meant that when I wanted to work on something, I had to go and meet entrepreneurs at the beginning when they were staking out an industry, trying to understand where they were gonna compete, raising their first capital. And then at the best, we might be able to bank them. And at, at the second best, I would have a great relationship for, with them for writing research. And my job was helping them, you know, do the best they could competitively and strategically and and drive and grow their businesses these startup businesses to go public and um 
So when I looked at my career and went back to MIT, that's what I loved. And that's how I ended up in venture capital, um, investing for the state of Massachusetts. And um, like I said, I did that for six and a half years. The best known company that I was uh, involved in leading the deal for Mass Ventures with was Ginkgo Bioworks. Yeah. Right. So this is a synthetic biology company, but I really mm -hmm. thought about it as a data company, right? Where you're you're using they, robotics yeah. to iterate the data you could get about these organisms at scale and build better and better, more efficient organisms, right? So that's how we thought about synthetic biology. Um, and I feel really blessed that some of the other companies that I also invested in there have now gone on to raise their Series B. So how does that relate to the question you asked me about tech stars? Well, in the course of being an investor for the state of Massachusetts, we were really charged with being where others were not because we we're investing the state's money in an evergreen fund. And you could say tech stars would be where everybody would wanna be. But to me, it was about being where companies were really beginning, very early stage, pre-seed to seed, and then I was active at MIT, active at the Harvard iLab, active in the Mass Challenge, which is a not-for-profit incubator here in Massachusetts. And um, I was visiting, observing, and looking at investing in Techstars companies. And what I felt about Techstars was they have one of the strongest programs for once you have some sense of what you want to go build and what you think customers need exercising the mu the muscles of building a company like they're very very rigorous about operating teaching you to have kpis set them and meet them building the discipline and the muscle into the company so that when you leave the program you're really off and running on your own so you asked me what do i think is different about YC and Techstars. And um, we have a classmate who went through YC, so we know it that yeah. way, right? Dan Knox yeah. and, and Elizabeth Irons from Science Exchange. Um, and what I think is different, I think that YC is a little more hands-off. Like they give you the network, they give you the investor connections, but then it's really yours to run that company. And I'm not saying that Techstars is all up in your business. That's not what I mean. I just mean that they really pay special attention to helping you get the fundamentals for you and your company right. And yeah, I think that's really valuable. Having you know watched a lot of companies over 30 something, almost 30 years now, so. No, I mean, you have, Jennifer, you have an awesome, awesome experience of all working with all these early stage ventures and different investment styles and incubation and acceleration styles. Mm -hmm. uh, while we are on the topic of uh, Techstar and YC, do you think, Jennifer, that they cater to different types of teams and entrepreneurs and for certain types of teams, maybe Techstar is a better answer and for maybe other type of teams, YC is an answer. So if you, if somebody uh, is, is, you know, listening to this podcast and drawing upon your expertise and they are figuring out that, okay, you know, what type of a program, incubation program or acceleration program is right for me? What kind of practical advice or a thinking framework you will give to somebody who's trying to make that decision? Sure. Um, the first thing I would think is both YC and Techstars are really about, um, on some level, they are about building venture scale businesses. But I would say that given this model of the focus on operations, that um, Techstars has a little more diversity in their base of the types and scales of businesses that people build. Um, the second, but I would say that if you're going for venture backed business, these are two really great bets. And um, both of them have really similar uh, deals and economics. So you, you really can't go wrong with either if you want that accelerant experience. 
Um, the other thing that I would say about Techstars is one of the things that they have done is really build out regionally. So you don't have to be in Silicon Valley to access the network. This is a very powerful global network. It's got locations in Boston, Chicago, LA, Austin, um, London, Tel Aviv. It's been in South Africa. So you, you can be coming from all over the world and meeting the Techstars program. The other thing that it has is um, some programs that are really specific for different disciplines. So if you're building um, consumer facing payments company, our partnership with Western Union might be a really powerful place to apply. I just came from managing and serving as the managing director for the Barclays FinTech program in New York, the Barclays New York Accelerator. Um, we have two sports focused accelerators, a new one ramping up in Minneapolis, and we have the Indie Sports Accelerator run by Jordan Flegel uh, out of Indianapolis. So, you know, there's just a tremendous risk, richness there, as well as an accelerator focused really on um, deep tech and another one focused on space tech. Yeah, so those are places where we've convened the network and the partners that you want to meet if you're in those businesses, so. No, that is, that is, that is awesome. Uh, in your experience all these years, Jennifer, of doing this, are there attributes and patterns uh, that are common that uh, differentiate between a successful startup from uh, maybe somebody who does not uh, get to reach their fullest potential? And I'm sure those probably those patterns, uh, they change uh, over time, depending upon which uh, part of the lifestyle you're at. But any insights on uh, what are the, the, the do's and the don'ts and the winning formulas or oh, you, know, in, in, in you, you and I, we talked about AI. So AI is a lot about the right kind of attributes and then those attributes having a predictive power. So we'd love to hear if there are common uh, patterns or recipes that people can leverage. Um, this is a really, really great question. And it's a particularly interesting question when you focus at the seed and sort of pre-seed stage where I spend a lot of my time. Because you know, it's really different from when I was in the public equities market or even before people were going public when you can dig into cash flows, dig into growth, and there's something really there. Here, you're looking for this signal that, um, and there's a lot of noise, right? We know we're yeah. very frequently not right. Um, but some of those unique signals are, I'm looking for founders who have um, a really strong take on their sort of vision of the world and think where things are going, but they also have this certain ear for the customer. So there's like a vision and a almost stubbornness, but there's also a tremendous flexibility and resilience. Like bamboo, they're gonna bend yeah. and snap back. They're gonna move with the winds until they hit that place where they've got the wedge into the market. And then the other thing that I'm looking for is like a bent to execution. This drive to get things done that is almost like there's signal of it and there's a feeling of it when you meet them. Um, so those are the major things. And this is a great question for me to ask you because you have that drive in spades and you've always gone about it a little differently by starting bootstrapped first. So maybe I could ask you a little bit about lessons that you took from um, building your first company, Silk Route, to Algo. And what, yeah. what did you learn and what changed, especially as you chose to go and raise capital this time? Yeah, so, so no, I think the, you're right that the common pattern uh, for both of them were they were bootstrapped, they were bootstrapped companies. And that is just a personal choice uh, sort of a thing. And uh, the reason behind that is, well, uh, 
you if you are putting your own money and resources and you're not getting paid for a while well then you really are very committed you you know you think differently uh you try to be you know lean you try to be on top of the execution machine uh you don't get attached to uh an idea so if you have to pivot or make adjustments uh you are you know under the darwinian uh, evolution and what not and to your point jennifer listening to customers and making sure that somebody is willing to uh pay for that innovation uh, uh that i think is that is it is awesome another thing jennifer that i have learned is uh for any software or technology that is going to solve real life problems if you don't have it a real customer engaged with their uh, data their use cases their very critical input uh, their uh, their time investment if you are just out there in a lab setting you miss out you miss out a lot so mm -hmm. i my sort of style always have been that okay you know you feel uh, strong about a, a problem in my case it has been a combination of uh, how to use uh, big data and different methods from optimization machine learning uh, natural language to solve different supply chain problems uh, but you know having a customer on the table uh and bringing those perspectives that is just so so valuable because then what you are doing is uh is actually meaningful and you and you learn a lot you are able to iterate quickly uh, if you you know reciprocate and give them the respect of okay you are investing your time uh maybe some money and then i am listening uh i'm adding my product vision definitely i'm not you know going to become an it mm -hmm. for your for your company so that i think uh, uh i just for personally for me that style being close to the customer being close to the problem where they can give immediate feedback where i don't have to uh mm -hmm. have delayed mm -hmm. feedback or go to them later where they can say no this is good this is not good you know how about this how about that so that i just find that very very helpful and the the difference between uh uh silkrout and algo was silkrout uh was solving problems with maybe an uh, earlier generation of software engineering mm -hmm. technology and maybe the uh, classic machine learning methods and what have you mm -hmm. and we also we learned uh, jennifer that a lot of uh, data mm -hmm. does not exist in structured format that there That's is a lot of data out there but it is not offered to you on a silver platter it is mm -hmm. not in some structured sql database for you to build your wonderful um, machine learning on top of it so we figured out okay well how to go source this messy unstructured data and bring it together and make sense of it and marry it up with somebody's first per first sort of you know uh, first person data or their you know company's private data and that was the algo journey where we uh, said well you know let's go there the other big difference between algo and silkrout was Algo is also Jennifer a virtual business analyst AI mm -hmm. persona. So in Algo ah. uh, it is, there is no traditional software interface you are talking to always this virtual business analyst colleague named Algo. So ah. as a result as a result you know we all at Algo we are called Algo colleagues because uh, the users are interacting with Algo uh this AI personality and uh and then this uh ai persona is able to learn uh what an individuals or a group or a teams 
job or function is, what their goals are, uh, how those goals can impact some other team's goals and what have you. So it tries to bring a lot of you know, visibility, uh, agility, uh, maybe even uh, access, accuracy, those types of things. So we, uh, that was the genesis of Algo and uh, those convictions paid off. Certainly, you know, uh, life in startups is always very, very hard, especially when you are bootstrapping mm -hmm. and, and you are totally on your own. Uh, so no, that is a very good question, which uh, I'll, uh, to continue with our chat, we'll ask you this, that uh, organizations, when they think about Jennifer, uh, innovation today, mm -hmm. uh, some, of the, some of them, you know, say, well, uh, how do we innovate and uh, shall we set up a venture studio or <laughs> do we buy, do we build? And mm -hmm. uh, over the past 10 years or so, this venture studio model has evolved quite a bit. Venture studio as its own mm -hmm. thing, venture studio in a Fortune 500 company so I'm sure you have point of view on uh, venture studios and where they work best. And so oh, I'll, yeah. yeah, I would love this, to hear your perspective on that. That's a really, really great question. So first, um, I want to go back to something, though, that you brought up. I, one of the things I really love about you, Amjad, and the way that you've built both your companies is you are one of the most profoundly technical founders that I know, right? Deeply, deeply, profoundly technical, mathematical to the nth degree, well beyond most of the places my brain can stretch. And um, yet you have that ear for the customer, for what they really need to solve in creating value. And when you ask me about what I look for in companies, one of my biggest lessons from one of my early investments came from not recognizing um, the, the place in a team where founders, the, the core founders might not have a healthy enough respect for each other's roles. Yeah. And to me, that is critical. Like a, a technical founder has to be able to hear the feedback of let's say if it's the CEO who's out in the field getting the customer information, they have to be able to hear that even if they're the holder of the vision and vice versa, right? If the technical founder is saying to you, there's really a reason why this cannot be done this way and you gotta be hearing it if you're not. And those, those things can be pretty subtle but now right in the first couple meetings with founders, I'm looking for that signal is, is there a healthy enough respect? So um, how does that relate to the next question that you just asked me? Like, do I have a view of the world around um, corporate venturing and venture studio models? And I guess I'm of two minds. One mind is what's your real objective? Like, We've seen um, corporate venture models that can back and build very large companies, um, both internal to the organization and external. So I'll give an odd example, perhaps. Uh, Wells Fargo, enormous bank, known internally for like their way or the highway on the IT and tech side. They like to build inside. But they have a venture arm that's completely separate from Wells Fargo. Norwest is the Wells, was Wells Fargo money. Yeah. Hugely successful traditional venture firm, truly seeking venture returns. They also do a tremendous job investing off their balance sheet with a venture team inside. It took many years for the lead of that Quan Pen to get, to get them to buy into this vision. But here, they invest in things that they believe uh, create value for their customers, their, their corporate customers. I think that's really interesting, right? But um, I, those are places where you, I really see that you can create and get to venture scale returns. I still have some question 
on strategic venture studioing, where the goal is really to identify things that fit the corporate agenda. Because there you're in that builder buy. And the yeah. thing you may be seeking may be pretty niche to the organization or to a set of organizations. And that may not allow for the same disruption and scale. But on the other hand, there's plenty of contradictory examples, right? And I'm looking at one now from within our um, Techstars uh, New York Barclays program. Uh, we have a company that is coming out, actually coming out of Barclays, two founders who are also part of Lehman Brothers who truly understand the challenges of when you're trying to scale uh, data and analytics solutions in you know, lots of heavy data with lots of infrastructure and architecture and you need to spin up that architecture fast. They've built a low code um, rules-based language that lets you do things that normally are 10,000 or 100,000 lines of code in something like 60 wow. to 100 lines of code. I mean. This is a thing that will have its niche wedge, but could potentially be enormous venture scale, right? So the, there are moments where you think, ah, oh, this could really work. <laughs> no, that is uh, so, so, so spot on. And, uh, but look, you know, I think uh, what we are saying is there is no right, there is no single right answer. There is uh, no harm in trying and so far as uh, people experiment and you, you, you learn from yeah. uh, your surroundings, uh, all form of innovation. All are forms of innovation. I think one of the key things that you hitched on was, I mean, one of the reasons that corporations like these programs and they partner with Techstars is because you're also trying to engage your team in that spirit of the rapid iteration that comes in the startup and that, that really customer focused feet thinking, whether it's internal customer, like another team in your organization or external customer. And um, when you have that and it's working well, it can be super, super exciting. And those partners can really accelerate businesses, right? Yeah. So, and no. they can do really amazing things. Like the, the I'm impressed by the caliber of founders I just saw in the screening for the, the Techstars Western Union program. And that's all about, Western Union's all about serving the underbanked and unbanked and and people sending remittances overseas, right? So this is place yeah. is ripe for huge innovation right now, which kind no, of that, brings that's us. That's awesome. Is uh, Jennifer's Techstars uh, expanding internationally? Are, are you guys going into maybe some underserved, underserved areas? And uh, to your point, so maybe you want to, uh, for uh, viewers, who don't know about that, maybe want to expand upon uh, that sort of sure. global approach of Techstar. Yeah, I think one of the, what I would say, watch, watch this space, right? Because we have a new CEO, a woman from France named Maëlle Gavet, who was brought in really with the vision of looking at how do we scale? There's a real belief that, and we've seen it demonstrated, right? People who can build amazing companies come from all sorts of backgrounds from all over the world. And sometimes it's that thing of having an outside perspective that makes all the difference. So I mentioned Techstars has uh, already been in London and Tel Aviv and South Africa. Uh, we've been in Mexico City in the past. We are looking at expanding there. We're in the Midwest of the US and Kansas City. Um, in New in Atlanta, in Minneapolis, and I think in the next year you'll see us really think about this on a more global scale. And in fact, our network of people who run um, startup weekends and provide exposure to entrepreneurship that's even more global. It has an enormous presence in Latin America and parts of Africa, driven by young people, predominantly who thirst for this access yeah. and entrepreneurship and they've leveraged our network, right? So, so it is really an exciting time to think about no, what could be done globally. So cool, so cool. Sometimes people feel that, oh, you know, this thing is only for, you know, young people. And if you are not in your mid twenties, then nobody's going to take you seriously. And if, you know, somebody in their, 
late thirties, forties, you know, whatever, that it is going to count, count against you. Uh, then you also hear things like, you know, that, hey, uh, uh, diversity under representation, whether it is uh, gender diversity, meaning uh, female, mm -hmm. uh, female owners, or, you know, maybe other minorities, you know, uh, African-American, uh, Latin communities, uh, or even LGBTQ communities. So I, since I know that you are very passionate about it because I, I follow you closely. So if you maybe want to go into that and- Sure. Kind of talk about that, oh, what biases or patterns still exist. And then if somebody is, you know, a, uh, is coming from these communities, uh, what is sort of your, you know, advice uh, for them and, I know that I asked so many questions here in one, but this is, this is definitely, I was going to ask you this because oh. you, I know that you are so passionate about yeah. this. I love that you asked me this question because it touches on so many things. And um, I, the, the primary thing that I think about is um, when we see the biggest value unlocked a lot of the time, um, when you really look at those teams and you look at the, the best returns, they're coming from teams that, that build diversity into their culture. And I think we're just in the beginning steps of this journey. And the reason I think that is because we've been working to get more capital to, to women-led companies for now, concertedly working at it for 10 years. And we still barely need them move the needle. We went from like 1.9-ish percent 10-ish years ago, like to maybe 2.1 to a high in 2019 of 2.9% of all venture. Now venture is a small, like yeah. in the world of, it's a small asset class, but it's, we, we funded more female led companies than ever before because the asset class as a whole grew, but we yeah. didn't really pick up a larger percentage. And in the downturn last year or in the crisis, that percentage going to female led companies shrunk back down to 2.1%. And we're now working to recover it. So that's coming at the same time that we understand that founders of color face this challenge in spades and their numbers are like 0.01% for female led, uh, black women led companies, for example. So um, this means that to walk the talk as investors, we have a ton more work to do to um, bring more underrepresented investors into the field, to bring more underrepresented founders into the field and to, to back them with capital. Um, one of the things I worry about a lot is the place of, well, we've seeded these companies, but we also know from the data that they face a greater fall off at A than they should be based on the percentages they're seeded. So this support for capital has to, has to move up the whole scale. The only place where you don't really see that is around series C. Okay. B, late B and C, sometimes you don't see that as much. And the reason is because if somebody's managed to get there, they've either been kind of bootstrappy or a little hand to mouth, or they've really broken out, right? Yeah. And, um, in that case, in that moment, they actually sometimes look better than their counterpart companies because they've been more capital efficient and they've often been forced to get to better margins faster. Yeah. So at those later stages, we look awesome. But in this earlier stage, there's still a lot of work to do. So if we, if we want to probe into it a little bit more, mm -hmm. uh, again, you know, I know that uh, uh, generalizations is never a good idea. But when I look at investors, uh, mm -hmm. they are your very smart people, uh, MBAs from very well-reputed universities, scientists, other very smart people, and then you know, junior people, mid-level experience, senior people. It is as smart as it gets. So then for, uh, diversity and minority participation for early stage and for series A to be that low, is there some systemic 
uh, bias is some filtering mechanisms not in place where uh, people don't get the right level of attention. Like, what is it that is- Oh a, yeah, I know, love that you asked that, me this. That, that, you know, that doesn't allow, because, you know, when I look at the investors, they are smart, they are reasonable, they want, they, be, they are all schooled about efficient capital markets and optimal allocation strategies. And we all get taught diversification on portfolios. So what is it, uh, Jennifer, that, you know, what structural uh, uh, and I think biases, filtering mechanisms that don't allow for that demand and supply to meet each other? Oh, I think there's probably two things. Maybe there's more things than two things, but one is, yes, the systemic bias is there. We know that from the data that we now have about things like what happens in the room when investors talk to female investors and talk to male investors, there's great um, data about that about from the London School of Economics and Harvard and MIT about the risk-based questions that women tend to get more of versus opportunity-based questions and how that already paints you into a, a box of sort of defending versus looking at the larger opportunity that VCs like to triangulate on. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, again, we talked about this as being, um, especially in those early stages, this has not been a data-driven business, right? We don't have really good data about what is it that first company look like what's really going on there because there's not a lot there yet there's no revenue there's no you know it's really the people and the team and this the market and um i think sometimes that sort of pattern matching becomes self-reinforcing and you don't realize that there could be a much broader aperture the other thing that I think about, I'm going to borrow from something I've been reading in the past week related to my other work on AI trust and transparency. I've been reading the book, The Hype Machine, right, which is about social networks. And one of the things that they describe really well is this place of um, having homophily, where we have very close connections that all look the same. And then outliers come from when you bridge those close clusters. Yeah. And one of the things we know about founders of color, underrepresented founders, and sometimes immigrant founders, it's why we have Thai angels, right, for Indian yeah. entrepreneurs, is that um, homophily doesn't always breed access, hmm. right? That people, people who are outside of those tight clusters may not have access to the network. Yeah. And when I work with female founders, it's not that they don't have talent for spades, it's aperture of access. And yeah. that's kind of on us as the VCs because no founder who's a world-class awesome founder wants to be known as the founder that was sought for their color or their race or whatever. They want to be known for the great things that they're building yeah. and the incredible capacity that they have. And that means we have to go out and seek them that way. Right. I think that's the, the, for me, that's the attitude that has to change. And that's the attitude I think is gradually changing. Right. But we really have to put a mindset and a set of activities to doing that seeking. Right. Yeah. No, that and is, and these awesome. founders are like yourself, ri ridiculously resilient and persistent. Right. Yeah. No, that is uh, so, so awesome. Uh, and you uh, just uh, uh, mentioned this thing, so I think we can we can go there where mm -hmm. uh, uh, your interest in uh, data trusts and 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 the whole security around that. And I think there is a huge area of opportunity and entrepreneurship of how uh, these data trusts are formed and the federated structures and uh, uh, mm -hmm. all the rules and stuff around it. And maybe there. Uh, ML and uh, blockchains and other technologies that come together. And uh, as we were just talking uh, uh, off camera, that this area could be as big as cybersecurity. So anything, you know, uh, that you want to sure. talk about from oh, yeah. where you see in the data trust space, where Jennifer, you see the opportunity or 
use cases or I know that it is still early on, but you have this vision. Uh, I want that yeah. vision to reach other people. Okay, you're talking my language. You're really talking my language now because you touched on so many different things. So I have this belief that if we want to get everything that we want to get out of AI and the promise of machine learning tools, just like you've seen in supply chain, that we need to do two things really, really well. One is we have to think about the, the, the tools and infrastructure that will emerge and needs to emerge to support these applications at scale throughout their life cycle. And those are gonna be things like data trusts and privacy and governance related tools. And uh, they will be things around risk and compliance. They will be things around ops and then robustness and security, that stuff's gonna happen. And because we expect so many applications to be automated decision-making, this market's gonna grow a pace with AI applications. And if it does that, it looks like cyber growing a pace with the internet, right? And that was a market that went from maybe four or 5 billion, which is about where we are now with these AI infrastructure pieces to, last year about 150 billion spent on cybersecurity applications. So that's the type of pace and scale that we could see with AI uh, trust, transparency, accountability, infrastructure or lifecycle management. And it's super, super important and it's not just about um, it is about bias and fairness in data, which we can talk about for a second and how that ties to uh, diverse entrepreneurs. Yeah. It's also about, you know, really managing this stuff in life cycle because you are talking about systems, which you just described with algo that have strong feedback loops. Yeah. Does what you're trying to make predictions about in the world still hold up? If it's starting to shift or if you're living on the edge, how do you get that info back? Yeah. How do you keep the hardware and the model and the data coming into the model all in sync, right? So you don't have false positives or have challenges. And these are things we've not been managing well for years. And now we're on, we're at hyperscale or about to be at hyperscale with them. So we need to do much better. How does this tie to like data, data stores, blockchain? One of the things that I find most interesting about this moment in technology is a lot of times the people who are seeing the opportunities to use it differently or seeing the gaps in the data that we have are founders who are diverse. So let me give you two examples. One is a young man who was an immigrant to the US who realized that it was really, really hard for him to get paid in certain ways. And so he's built a company that lets creators access the payment from their work pretty much real time. So these are creators who are on Spotify and on, and this is paperchain.io. They're on Spotify, they're on Twitch, they're on YouTube. Those, com those large companies pay these creators sort of at the end of a quarter or at the end of a period and they calculate you know, what the royalties are on their creation. This company leverages blockchain and the uh, crypto and NFT market to get an arbitrage that lets them pay these creators almost real time. So they can carry a debit card that's assessing the value of what they've earned and, and providing them money in their wallet so they can go and do more creation, right? That's a Wonderful. unique solution that's leveraging the blockchain in a unique way that will, as they gain more skill, have AI capability to predict these earnings better um, and to do better on the, the, the trading side, right? Yeah. But, but that took something special. A different example is a company, um, and I wish I had, you know, had capital on hand to make this investment when I first met them, um, Joy Bulamwini, who was then at the MIT Media Lab, who's become so famous for the Algorithmic Justice League and the film Coded yeah. Bias. She yeah. introduced me to this founder. Um, it, it, the company is 54Gene. 
54 gene is a Nigerian doctor who recognized that the genomic data that we have today that has made more than 20,000 diagnostic tests for things like different cancers is predominantly coming from white male European donors. Hmm. And they, it, because those were the first people to send their stuff to, yeah. to 23 and me, because yeah. that's who 20 and three and me was kind of marketing to yeah. and, um, and who was curious about it and who had access. So we have a data set today that's driving all these medical diagnostics that's 87% white European male and about 17% Asian because of the push that China has made into AI and medicine to, to respond and be as good as the brood here in Boston, yeah. right? And um, that didn't come out exactly the right way. So I apologize. I didn't mean to offend anyone in China about the medicine that didn't come out right. But scaling right really yeah. scaling this founder realized that there was not a strong set of african genomic data he realized that lagos was just at the cusp of beginning their electronic health records and he formed a company to do both the gathering of genomic whole genome data as people get their tests and the capturing of the clinical medical record when you put them together, it's a really powerful, unique data set that brings diversity that we need in the world. And it yeah. took someone to see that, right? And that's like, that's going to make our AI yeah. much more effective, much more predictive, much more uh, inclusive, right? And that to me is part of trust, transparency, and accountability. No, that is, that is awesome. I, uh, since everything, uh, in life has a dark side and the dark side has to be managed. Mm -hmm. I, the other day, Jennifer was uh, reading um, uh, some, a post, a social media post that Max Tegmark, he's a MIT professor and physicist, mm -hmm. smart, smart guy. So he posted this uh, uh, news clip about uh, a pretty terrifying story where uh, an MIT uh, grad of Turkish origins uh, mm -hmm. went back to Turkey and made these uh, lethal sort of drones using very standard uh, technology, paired it with normal AI and just combined things in a way to build a, an autonomous killer it's machine. And, and then, you know, there were examples cited, uh, whether in Syria or Libya, where one party was using those autonomous drones to uh, kill, mm -hmm. you know, people mm -hmm. from the other side. And Max was not taking, you know, any side on that regional politics. Uh, he was just uh, using that as an example to talk about this dark side. And the point that he was making was how easy for mm -hmm. capable people it is to build those types of uh, machines. And he was uh, raising the point that places like MIT and others have a, uh, and society in general, but you know, these original incubators for this, these types of ideas and technology, which certainly universities uh, like MIT, Stanford, Caltech, they play a big role. Max was raising this point that universities need to take a lot more serious role teaching the ethics of AI and yeah. also was impressing upon that while governments and regulations, they lag behind the innovation that in some of these cases, uh, people need to be a little bit more forward thinking and not you know, wait too long. So I would love to hear your yeah. perspective on the whole ethics of uh, AI yeah. Uh, and, and these are certainly a lot yeah. more sort of, you know, life or death examples of it. So while it's a wonderful technology, yeah. you know, there is a dark side in terms of uh, use cases uh, and what have you. Uh, other people are using AI to make their ransomware very robust and rich and killer and, you know, really yeah. attack uh, uh, 
different countries' critical infrastructure, which is right. old and legacy and can't withstand modern attacks like that. So what 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 are your thoughts on the roles and responsibilities oh of god of like universities and of of corporations and all of us yeah. i think there's one of the things that i hope this moment is teaching us is um that we can't leave the conversation about ethics in the academy in a little corner right yeah. and we're starting to see like in the last let's call it five years, there's actually a woman who's tracking the number of tech and ethics and AI and ethics courses growing in universities. And it's gone from you know 20 or 30 to 60 or 70 to more than 200 the last time I looked at the, the, um, the, her spreadsheet, which is open source on Google. You can go and find it. And um, she's published a paper about that work. So I think that's progress. People are paying attention a little bit and starting to say, hey, we need to build this in. Um, policy will lag and regulation will lag. And for me, as an investor, one of the reasons I believe in working on this theme of AI trust and transparency, which I used to describe as investing at the intersection of AI and ethics, is about giving people the tools they need so that we can at least attempt to do better and we can harness the good that's available in this technology. Right. But that also means we have to be super vigilant. You're just starting to see the first startups emerge that want to work on uh, robustness of AI systems. Has data been tam tampered with? Has the model been tampered with? Can we get ahead of that? How do we protect them in these situations? And that we also have, you know, really great people with AI ethics backgrounds, whether it's Kathy Baxter at Salesforce or um, very, very importantly, Alka Patel over at the Jake, helping our government and institutions set policy and think through things about what it means to have um, human-aided AI. But I hope that this moment also lets us really revisit and think about things that we built in de facto into our tech by making certain choices, right? Like if we look at the biggest of the big fangs, most of the harms they've unleashed with AI have come from not taking that moment to think through what does this look like at scale. Yeah. Right. And, and also having optimized certain things that engage us in certain ways where there were decisions to make all the time about that. And for us as users of this technology, there's decisions to make all the time. So I, I believe it's both education but it's also invent like you know there was there is this place where sometimes people who really work on AI and who are driving to general intelligence, yeah, right, the singularity, yeah. say, well, but humans don't even understand why they make decisions, yeah, or um, how can we expect to hold the AI accountable if we can't really explain ourselves and hold ourselves accountable, and. I believe that's not a good enough answer, yeah. right? Because we have governments and laws and policies because we strive to hold ourselves accountable yeah. and we strive for some, uh, some sense of morality. I think we need the same thing when we think about, about building technology. And I also think that is why you make the investments to give people, even if it's the minimal tool, the first tool, because we will build on that, just like we did with cyber, right? First, yeah. first we had WatchGuard, right? Protect your perimeter. Yeah. Then we needed malware, right? Defense, because people are clever and yeah. we are not always ethical, right? Yeah. Like there's always gonna be that. I think we are gonna see the same thing evolve for AI. Max was uh, suggesting that, hey, uh, like doctors and some other professions for technologists, there should be oaths and where people, you know, commit to engineers, computer scientists, that their technology and solutions they will build will be for the betterment of mankind and not the other way around, that they will not play a role in building up technologies or solutions that are aimed at killing people and that sort of thing. So uh, no. I, I kind of like that idea. I mean, I think about that's the engineer's oath right? That came from the bridge that failed because there wasn't enough validation and yeah. testing done on the bridge. And 
um, workmanship was not what it was it was expected to do. And we hold people accountable for that, just like we hold people accountable to have car insurance. Um, I, I really believe in that as an investor. And when I'm working with startups, whether it's at Techstars or at MIT or uh, on my own, you know, I hold for myself this thing of first do no harm. It's your yeah. company. My job is to try to help you get where you want to go. Yeah, It's awesome if I'm aligned, but my first goal is first do no harm to that company and, and to you and, you know, ultimately to the world as I do it. Right. That's yeah. that I think is a really valuable prime directive. Right. Yeah. And people who work on things like autonomous vehicles say, hey, we try to think about safety as a first principle and we try to build that into both how we design and how we're going to support this technology. But that's not what we did say when we built the YouTube algorithm to optimize for certain things. And then it wow. shows videos to certain populations that probably shouldn't be seeing those videos at scale, right? Yeah. Would love to, uh, Jennifer, hear your thoughts on some of the limitations and hype around uh, the current narrow AI. Uh, so one question is, uh, with all the applications and popularity of deep neural networks, mm -hmm. they are still for the most part uh, black box uh, yeah. algorithms. And if you want to ask, okay, where is transparency? Where is explainability? Where is interpretability? Today, the mm -hmm. current state of the art on that is, okay, we will then mm -hmm. build another whole set of uh, neural networks, and they would try to guess what the ex explainability is. So this one neural network is performing a function and it mm -hmm. is black box. You cannot ask this neural network, hey buddy, why did you make this decision that you just did? And then the current sort of state of the art on explainability and interpretability is that let's another network observe this and try to come up with some sort of, you know, uh, story uh, that sounds plausible to mm -hmm. explain that this is probably what this thing is doing. So certainly not, you know, a, a very good solution. So first, would love to hear your thoughts on that. And second, just using uh, uh, self-driving cars and sometimes the hype that gets attached with how safe or robust uh, these full <laughs> self-driving computers can be and whatnot, and people end up losing their lives. Uh, would love to you know, <laughs> hear your perspective on, would we ever feel safe enough with a machine totally in charge of driving a car, driving a plane, 100% autonomous and no, no oversight or whatnot. So, Tell me a little bit about uh, what your uh, thinking or feeling is. I try to not have huge biases on this the stuff where I get where I'm going to need to tap out, right? Where I don't where I'm I'm reaching my limits of my understanding. But two two things come to mind. One is um, there was a lot in that question. So one is about can models really un ever un explain the black box? I think there's one of the things to be aware of is there's many, many ways to build these models. Yeah. And depending on what you're trying to achieve and what you may need to explain or watch out towards, you should be very thoughtful about what you're using for what, right? You may need, you may smaller data, simple interpretable model may be enough for a certain type of decision. And you don't need necessarily to have a neural network for yeah. something else, right? I do think it's challenging. Um, for example, we've talked to some financial institutions where they're still doing like building a decision tree that they think explains the model underneath the AI, but they're disconnected. And as the AI is getting more scaling and more, more robust, that description may not be as accurate. There's certain pe certainly people in model risk who are doing more sophisticated things than that. But I think the operative thing is to think about how did you design through where you want to go. Now, on people's comfort with total autonomy, 
that's a really interesting question because one of the things about our interactions with tech is that um, we're not immalleable. Yeah. Right. We we adjust to tech. We become addicted to our phones. Yeah. We give over autonomy quite easily yeah. when we learn to trust the machine. I, I, my favorite example is, I, I think it was about three or four years ago now in Boston, maybe it was a little longer, when Waze was really becoming popular and Google Maps was the yeah. voice in your head. Two cars in a row pulled up State Street and took a turn that they thought that the, the automated map software was telling them to take, the little voice was telling them to take without looking and plummeted themselves down the stairs of Boston's government center, right in the heart of our downtown, right? Wow. Because they were just listening to the algorithm and yeah. they didn't even bother to look that this doesn't actually look like a street. Yeah. Right. They just yeah. took the turn. So, yeah. so we are willing to give away that control and we probably do more frequently than we know. Um, I think it's more about a little bit more about that, that um, both how we choose and when we apply the, like, when does it make sense to really apply this, right? Yeah. Sometimes you hear things like, I think a blockchain is a great example. The first five years, it was like, it was the, the hammer seeking the nail for everything, right? Yeah. And, and that's not really the best way to go about this. Um, on the other hand, you've got people like companies like Fortelix, which is uh, uh, it's raised about 45 million. The founder is a guy named Ziv Benyamini who comes from chip design. He's really thinking about how do we make more robust management of self-driving and autonomous vehicles by doing deeper and more aggressive simulations than we've been able to do so far, right? So the, the work is there. There is this uh, notion or this school of thought, uh, I'm interested in your opinion on that, where uh, as opposed to autonomous AIs and what have you, always keeping some human in the loop and always figuring out that, okay, AI have its strengths, humans have their strengths, design business processes and workflows for any given setting that leverage human strengths that leverage AI strengths and they make each other's weaknesses irrelevant and kind of, you know, maybe AI is very intelligent at performing certain tasks, but human consciousness can say, hey buddy, let's not take this left turn here or right turn, there is no road here, uh, irrespective of what uh, your model is telling. So what are your thoughts on this sort of uh, yeah. human-centric approach versus sometimes when that people, they think that, no, no, we don't need any humans, totally 100% autonomy and 100% AI and bringing human in the loop oh. is a bad idea. Uh, so I know oh. the American camp, so you- I'm John, I'm so loving this conversation with you because you, you are hitting on all my favorite things. So, um, so a little background. When I started on this AI, idea of AI trust and transparency, I actually had a way out there idea. And the way out their idea was that the next generation of devices wouldn't be devices and it, we wouldn't interact with them in the same way that we are today with our phone. Like right now we're kind of on the hamster wheel of yeah. our laptops and our iPhones and, and our iPads. Like we're, we're, we're sucked in and the algorithm was designed to do that and our brains have gone right there. And um, I believe that there's this concept from the 60s when people were first designing computers that they that the era of calm devices could still be coming. And calm devices are where the device is smart enough to support you, but it's more like a cushion than a crutch is what my mm -hmm. friend Amber Case says, who's this cyber anthropologist. Um, and that's a place where it is like the human is still in the loop and the AI can be as smart as the AI can be. But, you know, our capacity to understand 
all the firings of our nuance and where the estimation lies as we do things like calculate where we are in space at any given moment while I'm still talking to you on the phone. It's, it's like beyond the capacity of what we've been able to build into these machines today. So let's give some credit to that. Yeah. Like I'm yeah. really of that human in the loop and credit to, you know, the US military so far, despite the ongoing debate about autonomy of weapons has basically said, if there is a, a kill directive at some point in there, a human still needs to be in the loop. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a pretty nice way to think about it, right? Yeah. Uh, one maybe last question, Jennifer, that I'll ask is, uh, what in your mind is the importance of having a, if you are an entrepreneur, a coach, an, a mentor, a sounding board, somebody you know, who could be a sort of you know, a true impartial advice and uh, help you identify your blind spots and doesn't always say what you want to hear that is that an important aspect of entrepreneurial life and if so how should entrepreneurs think about it go about it and seek such mentor relationships sure um i think it's critical that the founders who've gone before you the investors who've gone before you who've walked this path they've seen a lot and it can be really, really helpful when you're facing a decision. Not someone, someone who is a really good mentor isn't there to tell you what to do. They're there to help you think through it, yeah. right? And I think that's a really critical thing. It falls into my first do no harm. So seeking out people who have gone through it before, done it before, they can be in your industry, they can be out of your industry. I tend to like, have a bench of people who have functional expertise in certain areas that I go to for that kind of help and send my companies to. Of another set of people who are founders or technologists who have different skills, investors and people who've walked the scaling journey at different stages that I send people to as they're meeting that, those needs. I think it's absolutely critical. And full disclosure, we didn't talk about one. I just agreed to do that for a company that you incubated, AlgoFace, because I'm passionate about this idea that they are building facial analysis capabilities that is very diverse, that builds as first principle from a diverse data set, and that is not about recognition, but is about the other elements that we want to do better at communication and um, recognizing emotion and all those pieces. So. So, and, and the reason I do that is because this is how you help people, you speed them on the path to success. So, right. so true, absolutely. Any other thing, Jennifer, that you want to uh, talk about that we haven't uh, touched upon any other uh, as, as we wrap up oh. our conversation? I'm super looking forward to continuing the conversation with you. I think there's another conversation to have where we get to talk more about, um, I want to talk more about Algo and yeah. what the next steps are for growth for Algo, because yeah. you bootstrapped your way to this place. You just raised capital, which you did not have to do, yeah. which means you're on a path for even more growth. So there's a conversation there that maybe yeah. someday we can have. Um, the other thing I would say is if there are founders listening who are um, working on things around AI, trust, transparency, interpretability, accountability, who are looking at unique problems that will generate missing data sets, those things that are gaps that we were just talking about, uh, that are working on validation or robustness, I'm interested in that. I'd love to talk to you. That and, would be that would be great, and you know, yeah. uh, no, that I think that would be awesome. Jennifer, thank you for being so gracious with your time. It was so awesome, and we'll, as you said, we'll talk again. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully one day soon come visit Boston. I'll, you know, we'll coordinate calendars and 
meet somewhere, you know. You're absolutely my guest anytime you want to come to Boston. I'm just honored to be connected to you and to have you in my life, Amjad. It's amazing. Very likewise. Okay, keep growing. Keep glowing. <laughs>